Thank you, President Balaf, and all of you for attending today. I was so deeply moved first by Brother Porter's prayer and then this remarkable musical number. Yeah, I, th I thank uh, all of you and uh, express my appreciation to the Lord for my many blessings. You need to know that this responsibility to speak to you never gets any easier. I'm confident it gets more difficult, in fact, as the years go by. I grow a little older. The world and its litany of problems get a little more complex, and your hopes and dreams become ever more important to me the longer I am at BYU. Indeed, your growth, your happiness, and your development in the life you are now living at BYU and will be living somewhere else in the days and decades ahead, that is the central and most compelling motivation in my everyday professional life. I care very much about you now and forever. Everything I know to do at BYU is being done with an eye toward who and what you are and who and what you can become. The future of this world's history will be quite fully in your hands very soon. At least your portion of it will be. And an education at an institution sponsored and guided by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the greatest academic advantage I can imagine in preparation for such a serious and significant future. But that future, at least any qualitative aspect of it, must be vigorously fought for. It won't just happen to your advantage. Someone once said that the future is waiting to be seized, and if we do not grasp it firmly, then other hands, more determined and bloody than our own, will wrench it from us and follow a different course. So it is with an eye to that future, your future and mine, and an awareness of the immense sense of responsibility I feel for you that I approach this annual mid-year devotional message today. I always need the help of the Lord and His sustaining Spirit, but I especially feel the need for that spiritual help today. I make special note of and welcome on the stand our 15 BYU stake presidents or their representatives. The subject I wish to discuss with you this morning is very important to them and their crucially important work with you. And they, through their contacts with the university administration, have encouraged me to address this particular topic today. At a church university committed to the spiritual welfare of every student, we could not succeed, indeed we could not survive, without the work of our campus wards and stakes. It is our bishops and our stake presidents who have both the opportunity and the ecclesiastical responsibility to know your hearts, your habits, your joys, and your sorrows in a spiritual and very personal way. We thank them for their loving concern for the students of Brigham Young University. It is important that they hear what counsel I have for you. Even as I welcome these guests, may I note the temporary exclusion of some others. At my request, this talk is not being carried live on KBYU TV at this hour. It is being recorded and probably will be shown at another time. But this morning I did not want the distraction of speaking to anyone but you gathered together here in the Marriott Center. Indeed, if I had a way to do it, I would speak with much smaller groups of you gathered in much more personal settings. The Center is not a very personal setting, but I believe there will be at least some merit in waiting until another day to have the TV audience join us. Lastly, I note that because of the time pressures a discussion of this particular topic imposes, Sister Holland, who almost always shares these kinds of devotional assignments with me, has been willing to let me do the speaking today. That's even more of a loss to me than it is to you. But we knew of no other way to cover adequately the request that has been made and still stay within the very limited time we have on this, in this assembly. We have on occasion held you over, for which I apologize, 
and we do not ever want to do that, and we do not want you or ourselves rushed today with a feeling of any urgency. My topic, as you may have guessed by all this seriousness, is that of human intimacy, a topic as sacred as any I know and more sacred than anything I have ever addressed from this podium. If I am not careful, and if you are not supportive, this subject can slide quickly from the sacred into the merely sensational, and that would be devastating to me. It would be better not to address the topic at all than to damage it with casualness or carelessness. Indeed, it is against such casualness and carelessness that I wish to speak. So I ask for your faith and your prayers and your respect. You may feel this is a topic that you hear addressed too frequently at this time in your life, but given the world in which we live, you may not be hearing it enough. All of the prophets, past and present, have spoken on it. And President Benson himself addressed this very subject in his annual message to the student body last fall. I'm thrilled that most of you are doing wonderfully well in the matter of personal purity. There isn't as worthy and faithful a group of university students anywhere on the face of the earth. You are an absolute inspiration to me. I acknowledge your devotion to the gospel and I applaud it. Like Jacob of old, I would much prefer, particularly for the sake of the innocent, not to need to discuss such topics. But a few of you are not doing so well, and much of the world around us is not doing well at all. The national press recently noted, quote, In America, 3,000 adolescents become pregnant each day. A million a year. Four out of five are unmarried. More than half get abortions. Babies having babies. Babies killing babies. Close quote. That same national poll indicated nearly 60% of high school students in mainstream America, that's their phrase, had lost their virginity, and 80% of college students had. The Wall Street Journal, hardly in a class with the National Enquirer, recently wrote, AIDS appears to be reaching plague-like proportions. Even now, it is claiming innocent victims, newborn babies, recipients of blood transfusions. It is only a matter of time becomes, before it becomes widespread among heterosexuals. AIDS should remind us, continuing the quote, that ours is a hostile world. The more we pass ourselves around, the larger likelihood of picking something up. Whether on clinical or moral grounds, it seems clear that promiscuity has its price." Close quote. Of course, more widespread in our society than the indulgence of personal sexual activity is the printed and photographed descriptions of others who do. Of that lustful environment, a contemporary observer says, we live in an age in which voyeurism is no longer the sideline of the solitary deviate but rather a national pastime, fully institutionalized and fully circularized in the mass media." Close quote. It appears, in fact, that the rise of civilization has, ironically enough, made actual or fantasized promiscuity a greater, not a lesser, problem in our lives. Edward Gibbon, the distinguished British historian of the 18th century who wrote one of the most intimidating works of history in our language said simply, although the progress of civilization has undoubtedly contributed to assuage the fiercer passions of human nature, it seems to have been less favorable to the virtue of chastity. The refinements of life seem to corrupt even as they polish the relationship of the sexes." Close quote. I do not wish to spend this hour documenting social problems. I certainly do not intend to wring our hands over the dangers that such outside influences may hold for us. As serious as such contemporary realities are, I wish to discuss this topic in quite a different way, discuss it specifically for Latter-day Saints, 
primarily young, unmarried Latter-day Saints, even those attending Brigham Young University. So I conspicuously set aside the horrors of AIDS and national statistics of illegitimate pregnancy, and I speak rather to a gospel-based view of personal purity. Indeed, I wish to do something even a bit more difficult than listing the do's and don'ts of personal purity. I wish to speak, to the best of my ability, on why we should be clean, on why moral discipline is such a significant matter in God's eyes. I know that sounds presumptuous, but a philosopher once said, tell me sufficiently why a thing should be done, and I will move heaven and earth to do it, hoping you will feel the same as he, and with full recognition of my limitations, I wish to try to give at least a partial answer to why be morally clean. I will need first to pose briefly what I see as the doctrinal seriousness of the matter before then offering just three reasons for such seriousness. May I begin with one half of a nine-line poem by Robert Frost. The other half is worth a sermon, but it'll have to wait for another day. Here are the first four lines of Frost's Fire and Ice. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. A second, less poetic but more specific opinion is offered by the writer of Proverbs. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? Whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor, and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. In getting then at the doctrinal seriousness, why is this matter of sexual relationship so severe that fire is almost always the metaphor, with passion pictured vividly in flames? What is there in the potentially hurtful heat of this that leaves one's soul, or perhaps the whole world, according to Frost, destroyed if that flame is left unchecked? and those passions unrestrained. What is there in all of this that prompts Alma to warn his son Corianton that sexual transgression is, quote, an abomination in the sight of the Lord, yea, most abominable above all sins, save it be the shedding of innocent blood or the denying the Holy Ghost, close quote. Now, setting aside for a moment sins against the Holy Ghost, that's a special category in itself, it is LDS doctrine that sexual transgression is second only to murder in the Lord's list of life's most serious sins. By assigning such rank to a physical appetite so conspicuously evident in all of us, what is God trying to tell us about its place in His plan for all men and women in mortality? I submit to you He is doing precisely that, commenting about the very plan of life itself. Clearly, God's greatest concerns regarding mortality are how one gets into this world and how one gets out of it. These are the two most important issues in our very personal and carefully supervised progress. These are the two issues which He, as our Creator and Father and Guide, wishes most to reserve to himself. These are the two matters which he has repeatedly told us he wants us never to touch illegally, illicitly, unfaithfully, without sanction. Now, as for the taking of life, we're generally quite responsible. Most people, it seems to me, readily sense the sanctity of life, and as a rule do not run up to friends, put a loaded revolver to their heads, and cavalierly pull the trigger. 
Furthermore, when there's a click of the hammer instead of an explosion of lead, and a possible tragedy seems to have been averted, no one in such a circumstance would be so stupid as to sigh and say, oh good, I didn't go all the way. No, all the way or not, the insanity of such action with fatal powder and steel is obvious on the face of it. Such a person running about this campus with an arsenal of loaded handguns or military weaponry aimed at fellow students would be apprehended, prosecuted, and institutionalized if in fact such a lunatic would not himself have been killed in all the pandemonium. After such a fictitious moment on this campus, and you're too young to remember my college years when the sniper wasn't fictitious, killing 12 of his fellow students at the University of Texas, Nevertheless, on this campus, in our fictitious moment, we would undoubtedly sit in our dorms and classrooms with terror on our minds for many months to come, wondering how such a thing could possibly happen, especially at BYU. No, fortunately, in the case of how life is taken, I think we seem to be quite responsible. The seriousness of that does not often have to be spelled out and not many sermons need to be devoted to it. But in the significance and sanctity of giving life, some of us are not responsible at all. And in the larger world swirling around us, we find near criminal irresponsibility. What would, in the case of taking life, bring absolute horror and demand grim justice, in the case of giving life, brings dirty jokes and four-letter lyrics, and crass carnality on the silver screen, home-owned or downtown, is such a personal act of turpitude so wrong? That question has always been asked, particularly by the guilty. A proverb comes to mind. Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. No murder here. Maybe not. But sexual transgression? He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. Sounds nearly fatal to me. So much then for the doctrinal seriousness. Now with a desire to prevent such painful moments, to avoid what Alma called the inexpressible horror, of standing in the presence of God unworthily, and to permit the intimacy, it is your right and your privilege and your delight to enjoy in marriage and that it not be tainted by such crushing remorse and guilt. I wish to give those three reasons I mentioned earlier as to why I believe this is an issue of such magnitude and consequence. First, we simply must understand that revealed, restored, Latter-day Saint doctrine of the soul and of the high and inextricable part the body plays in that doctrine. One of the plain and precious truths restored in this dispensation is that the spirit and the body are the soul of man and that when the spirit and body are separated, men and women cannot receive a fullness of joy. Certainly that suggests something of the reason why the obtaining of a body is so fundamentally important to the plan of salvation in the first place. Why sin of any kind is such a serious matter, namely because its, uh, its automatic consequence is death, the separation of the spirit from the body, and then why the resurrection of the body is so central to the great and abiding and eternal triumph of Christ's atonement. So we do not have to be a herd of demonically possessed swine charging down the gathering slopes toward the sea to understand that a body is the great prize of mortal life and that even a pigs will do for those frenzied spirits that rebelled and to this day remain dispossessed in their first unembodied estate. May I quote a 1913 sermon 
by Elder James E. Talmage on this doctrinal point. We have been taught to look upon these bodies as gifts from God. We Latter-day Saints do not regard the body as something to be condemned, something to be abhorred. We regard the body as a sign of our royal birthright. We recognize that those who kept not their first estate were denied that inestimable blessing. We believe that these bodies may be made in very truth the temple of the Holy Ghost. It is particular, Brother Talmadge goes on, it, it is peculiar to the theology of the Latter-day Saints that we regard the body as an essential part of the soul. Read your dictionaries, he says, the lexicons and encyclopedias, and you will find that nowhere in Christianity outside of the Church of Jesus Christ is the solemn and eternal truth taught that the soul of man is the body and the spirit combined." Close quote. So partly in answer to why such seriousness, we answer that one toying with the God-given and satanically coveted body of another toys with the very soul of that individual, toys with the central purpose and product of life, the very key to life, as Elder Boyd K. Packer once called it. In trivializing the soul of another, please insert the word body there, we trivialize the atonement which saved that soul and guaranteed that body's continued existence. And when one toys with the Son of Righteousness, the Day Star himself, one toys at white heat with a flame hotter and holier than the noonday sun. You cannot do so and not be burned. You cannot with impunity crucify Christ afresh. Exploitation of the body, please insert the word soul there, is in the last analysis an exploitation of him who is the light and the life of the world. Perhaps then, here, Paul's warning to the Corinthians takes on newer, higher meaning. Quote, Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? God forbid! Flee fornication! He that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit." Close quote. Our soul, then, is what's at stake, our spirit and our body. Paul understood that doctrine of the soul every bit as well as James E. Talmadge did because it is gospel truth. The purchase price for our fullness of joy, body and spirit eternally united, is the pure and innocent blood of the Savior of this world. We cannot then say in ignorance or defiance, well, it's my life, or worse yet, it's my body. It is not. You are not your own, Paul said. You were bought with a price. So in answer to the question, why does God care so much about sexual transgression, it is partly because of the precious gift offered by and through His only begotten Son to redeem those souls, those bodies and spirits we share and abuse in such cheap and tawdry ways. Christ restored the very seeds of eternal lives, and we desecrate them at our peril. The first key reason for personal purity, our souls are involved and at stake. Second, may I suggest that human intimacy, that sacred physical union ordained of God for a married couple, deals with a symbol that demands special sanctity. Now, such an act of love between a man and a woman is or certainly was ordained to be a symbol of their total union, union of their hearts, their hopes, their lives, their love, their family, their future, their everything. It's a symbol that we try to suggest in the temple with a word like seal. 
Prophet Joseph Smith once said we perhaps ought to render such a sacred bond as, as welding, that those united in matrimony and eternal families are welded together, inseparable, if you will, to withstand the temptations of the adversary and the afflictions of mortality. But such a total, virtually unbreakable union, such an unyielding commitment between a man and a woman, can only come with the proximity and the permanence afforded in a marriage covenant. With the union of all they possess, their very hearts and minds, their days and all their dreams. They work together, they cry together, they enjoy Brahms and Beethoven and breakfast together. They sacrifice and save and live together for all the abundance that such a totally intimate life provides such a couple. And the external symbol of that union, the physical manifestation of what is a far deeper spiritual and metaphysical bonding, is the physical blending of two bodies. Indeed, a most beautiful and gratifying expression of that larger, more complete union of eternal purpose and promise. Now, as delicate as it is to mention in such a setting, I nevertheless trust your maturity to understand that physiologically we are created as men and women to fit together in such a union. In this ultimate expression, from one man to one woman, they are as nearly and as literally one as two separate physical bodies can ever be. It is in that act of ultimate physical intimacy we most nearly fulfill the commandment of the Lord given to Adam and Eve, living symbols for all married couples, when he invited them to cleave unto one another only and thus become one flesh. Now, obviously, such a commandment to these two, the first husband and wife of the human family, has unlimited social and cultural and religious implications as well as the physical. But that is exactly my point. As all couples come to that moment of bonding in mortality, it is to be just such a complete union. That commandment cannot be fulfilled, and that symbolism of one flesh cannot be preserved if we hastily and guiltily and surreptitiously share intimacy in a darkened corner of a darkened hour, and then just as hastily and guiltily and surreptitiously retreat to our separate worlds, not to eat or live or cry or laugh together, not to do the laundry and the dishes and the homework, not to manage a budget and pay the bills and tend the children and plan for the future. No, we cannot do that until we're truly one, united, bound, linked, tied, welded, sealed, married. Can you see then the moral schizophrenia that comes from pretending we are one? Sharing the physical symbols and physical intimacy of our union, but then fleeing, retreating, severing all other such aspects and symbols of what was meant to be a total obligation, only to unite again furtively some other night. Or worse yet, furtively, and you can tell how cynically I use that word, unite with some other partner who is no more bound to us, no more one with us than the last was. Or the one that will come next week or next month or next year or any time before the binding commitments of marriage. You must wait. You must wait until you can give everything. And you cannot give everything until you are at least legally and for Latter-day Saint purposes, eternally pronounced as one. To give illicitly that which is not yours to give, remember you are not your own, and to give only part of that which cannot be followed with the gift of your whole heart and your whole life and your whole self is its own form of emotional Russian roulette. If you persist in sharing part without the whole, in pursuing satisfaction devoid of symbolism, in giving parts and pieces and inflamed fragments only, you run the terrible risk of such spiritual, psychic damage that you may undermine both your physical intimacy and your wholehearted devotion to a truer, later love. You may come to that moment of real love or total union only to discover to your horror that what you should have saved has been spent. And mark my words, 
Only God's grace can recover the piecemeal dissipation of your virtue. A good Latter-day Saint friend has written of this issue. Fragmentation enables its users to counterfeit intimacy. If we relate to each other in fragments, at best we miss full relationships. At worst, we manipulate and exploit others for our gratification. Sexual fragmentation can be particularly harmful because it gives powerful physiological rewards, which, though illusory, can temporarily persuade us to overlook the serious deficits in the overall relationship. People may marry for physical gratification and then discover that the illusion of union collapses under the weight of intellectual, social, and spiritual incompatibility. Sexual fragmentation, to continue the quote, is particularly harmful because it is particularly deceptive. The intense human intimacy that should be enjoyed in and symbolized by sexual union is counterfeited by sensual episodes which suggest but cannot deliver acceptance, understanding, and love. Such encounters mistake the end for the means as lonely, desperate people seek a common denominator which will permit the easiest, quickest gratification." Close quote. Listen to a far more biting observation by a non-Latter-day Saint regarding such acts devoid of both the soul and the symbolism we've been discussing. Our sexuality, he writes, has been animalized, stripped of the intricacy of feeling with which human beings have endowed it, leaving us to contemplate only the act and to fear our impotence in it. It is this animal animalization from which the sexual manuals cannot escape, even when they try to do so, because they're reflections of it. They might as well be textbooks for veterinarians. In this matter of counterfeit intimacy and, and deceptive gratification, I express particular caution to the men who hear my message. I have heard all my life that it is the young woman who has to assume the responsibility for controlling the limits of intimacy in courtship because a young man cannot. Seldom have I heard any point made on this subject that makes me want to throw up more than that. <laughs> what kind of man is he? What priesthood or power or strength or self-control does this man have that lets him develop in society, grow to the age of mature accountability, perhaps even pursue a university education, and prepare to affect the future of colleagues and kingdoms and the course of this world, but yet does not have the mental capacity or the moral will to say, I will not do that thing. No, this sorry drugstore psychology would have him say, I just can't help myself. My glands have complete control over my entire life, my mind, my will, my very future. To say that a young woman in such a relationship has to bear her responsibility and that of his too is the most discriminatory doctrine I have ever heard. If there is sexual transgression, I lay the burden squarely on the shoulders of the young man. For our purpose is probably a priesthood bearer, and that's where I believe God intended responsibility to be. Now, in saying that, I do not excuse young women who, ex who exercise no restraint and have not the char character or the conviction to demand intimacy only in its rightful place and role. I've had enough experience in church callings to know that women as well as men can be predatory. But I refuse to buy some young man's feigned innocence who wants to sin and call it psychology. Indeed, most tragically, it is the young woman who is most often the victim. It is the young woman who most often suffers the greater pain. It is the young woman who most often feels abused, used, and terribly unclean. And for that imposed uncleanliness, a man will pay as surely as the sun sets and rivers run to the sea. Note the prophet Jacob's straightforward language on this account in the Book of Mormon. After a bold confrontation on the subject of sexual transgression among the Nephites, he quotes Jehovah saying, Behold, I the Lord have seen the sorrow and heard the mourning of the daughters of my people in the land. And I will not suffer, saith the Lord of hosts, that the cries of the fair daughters of this people shall come up unto me against the men of my people, saith the Lord of hosts. For they shall not lead away the cap 
lead away captive the daughters of my people because of their tenderness. Save I shall visit them with a sore curse even unto destruction. Please don't be deceived and don't be destroyed. Unless such fire is controlled, your clothes and your future will be burned. And your world short of painful and perfect repentance will go up in flames. I give that to you on good word. I give it to you on God's word. That leads me to my last reason, a last effort to say why. After soul and symbol, the word is sacrament, a term closely related to the other two. Sexual intimacy is not only a symbolic union between a man and a woman, the uniting of their very souls, but it is also symbolic of a union between mortals and deity, between otherwise ordinary and fallible humans uniting for a rare and special moment with God Himself and all the powers by which He gives life in this wide universe of ours. In this latter sense, human intimacy is a sacrament, a very special kind of symbol. For our purpose here today, a sacrament could be any one of a number of gestures or acts or ordinances that unite us with God and His limitless powers. We are imperfect and mortal. He is perfect and immortal. But from time to time, indeed as often and as possible as is appropriate, we find ways and go to places and create circumstances where we can unite symbolically with Him and in so doing gain access to His power. Those special moments of union with God are sacramental moments, such as kneeling at a marriage altar or blessing a newborn baby or partaking of the emblems of the Lord's Supper. This latter ordinance is the one we in the Church have come to associate most traditionally with the word sacrament, though it is technically only one of many such moments when we formally take the hand of God and feel His divine power. These are moments when we quite literally unite our will with God's will, our spirit with His spirit, where communion through the veil becomes very real. At such moments we not only acknowledge His divinity, but we quite literally take something of that divinity to ourselves. Such are the holy sacraments. Now once again I know of no one, certainly no one here, who would, for example, rush into the middle of a sacramental service, grab the linen from the tables, throw the bread the full length of the room, tip the water trays onto the floor, and laughingly retreat from the building to await an opportunity to do the same thing at another worship service next Sunday. No one within the sound of my voice would do that, nor would anyone here violate any of the other sacramental moments in our lives, those times when we consciously claim God's power and by invitation stand with Him in privilege and principality. But I wish to stress with you this morning, as my last of three reasons to be clean, that sexual union is also in its own profound way a very real sacrament of the highest order. A union not only of a man and a woman, but very much the union of that man and woman with God. Indeed, if our definition of sacrament is that act of claiming and sharing and exercising God's own inestimable power, then I know of virtually no other divine privilege so routinely given to us all, women or men, ordained or unordained, Latter-day Saint or non-Latter-day Saint, than the miraculous and majestic power of transmitting life, that unspeakable, unfathomable, unbroken power of creation. These are the special moments in your lives. And other more formal ordinances will also let you feel the grace and grandeur of God. There are many such one-time experiences, your own confirmation or your own marriage, for example. Some are repeatable such as administering to the sick or doing ordinance work in the temple. But I know of nothing so earth-shatteringly powerful and yet so universally and unstintingly given as the God-given power available in every one of us from our early teens to create a human body. That wonder of all wonders, a genetically and spiritually unique being never seen before in the history of the world and never to be duplicated again in all the ages of eternity. A child, your child, with eyes and ears and fingers and toes and a future of unspeakable grandeur. Now imagine that, if you will. Veritable teenagers and all of us for many decades thereafter carrying 
daily, hourly, minute to minute, virtually every waking and sleeping moment of our lives, the power and the chemistry and the eternally transmitted seeds of life to grant someone else her second estate, someone else his next level of development in the divine plan of salvation. I submit to you that no power, priesthood or otherwise, is given by God so universally to so many with virtually no control over its use except self-control. And I submit to you that you will never be more like God at any other time in this life than when you are expressing that particular power. Of all the titles he has chosen for himself, Father is the one he declares and creation is his watchword, especially human creation, creation in his image. His glory isn't a mountain, as stunning as mountains are. It isn't in sea or sky or snow or sunrise as beautiful as all, uh, as all of them are. It isn't in art or technology, be that a concerto or a computer. No, his glory and his grief are in his children. You and I, we are his prized possessions. We are the earthly evidence, however inadequate, of what he truly is. Human life, that is the greatest of God's powers the most mysterious and magnificent chemistry of it all. And you and I have been given it, but under the most serious and sacred of restrictions. You and I who can make neither mountain nor moonlight, nor raindrop nor rose, yet we've been given this greater gift in an absolutely unlimited way. And the only control placed on us is self-control. Self-control born of respect for the divine sacramental power that it is. So surely God's trust in us to respect this future forming gift is an awesomely staggering one. We who may not be able to repair a bicycle nor assemble an average jigsaw puzzle, yet we in all of our weakness and imperfections carry this majestic procreative power which makes us so very much like God, at least in that one grand, majestic way. Souls, symbols, sacraments. Does any of this help as to why human intimacy is such a serious matter? Why it is so right and rewarding and stunningly beautiful when it is within marriage and approved of God, not just good but very good, he declared to Adam and Eve, and so blasphemously wrong like unto murder when it's outside such a covenant. It is my understanding that we park and pet and sleep over and sleep with at the very peril of our lives. Our penalty may not come on the precise day of our transgression, but it comes surely and certainly enough. And were it not for a merciful God and the treasured privilege of personal repentance, far too many would even now be feeling that hellish pain which, like the passion we've been discussing, is always described in the metaphor of fire. Someday, somewhere, sometime, the morally unclean will, unless they repent, pray like the rich man, wishing Lazarus to dip his finger in the water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Some say the world will end in fire, some in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. I love you for being on the right side of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May I close with this statement from James E. Talmage. It has been declared in the solemn word of Revelation that the spirit and the body constitute the soul of man, and therefore we should look upon this body as something that shall endure in the, respect, in the resurrected state beyond the grave, something to be kept pure and holy. Be not afraid of soiling its hands. Be not afraid of scars that may come to it if one in earnest effort or one in honest fight. 
But be aware of scars that disfigure, that have come to you in places where you ought not to have gone, that have befallen you in unworthy undertakings pursued where you ought not to have been. Beware of the wounds of battles in which you've been fighting on the wrong side. I bear testimony of the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of God's redeeming love for us expressed through the atoning blood of His Son, our Savior, even the Lord Jesus Christ. I bear testimony of you, of your privilege and your power, of your future, and the privilege that I feel to participate with you in the formation of that future. I consider it the greatest privilege of my life, and I love you for it, and I express hope and happiness for you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.